And I said, Kurt, tell me about this novel. What is it about this novel? And he says, this woman, what happened to her is what happened to me. And I'm sure Kurt wouldn't mind me saying this. She uses her... Um, if you think of Zang, uh, and I, I, I suppose a lot of you haven't read the book, Zang grows up in Grafenet, okay, and, and it's Grafenet in the 60s, and you have the Dumini, and you have the Doctor, and her mother is, is a Mrs. Olivia, uh, and they live in this house in Somerset Street, Grafenet, and, and everything is intact, it's, it's high apartheid, and so on, and Zang didn't have the benefit of sophisticated education or so, but she's in resistance. What she has is, is her body, and, and this she uses in all kinds of uh, highly eroticized situations, and, and she uses this as a form of dissidence. This is all she has. She doesn't have discourse in the sense of, of language to say uh, politically protest, but she has the language of the body, and in a sense uh, Zan E's body. Zan, you know, may, may I just go on? Um, often when, when one writes, um, a character comes to you, um, if you're lucky enough, as a, as a full person. The, the person walks into your mind and you can see the person and you, you have a feeling who this person is. And Zan came to me as as language. I was standing in Amsterdam in, in front of a gracht uh, in the house of Koen Stort. He was a uh, diplomat in South Africa when Mandela was arrested. And I was standing in Koen's huiskamer, as they say, looking over the Amstel, and I really... Zayn came to me, I thought it was a, a psychic episode or so. She came with, she reported as language. And, and, and that you know, Zana's character then as bottled as language, as, as let's say, uh, the organism as language almost. Uh, and there's a nice term that I've come across, Dr. Klopper uses it, your, your predecessor, Stegenbosch, and that is a bodyography. And this is the bodyography of Zan. The language becomes body. It was, in, it was invented by Sarah Nuttall. It was said, he refers to Sarah Nuttall, absolutely. Bodyographer, Sarah Nuttall. Yes. And, and it's an excellent term to describe embodiment and language. I need wine. <laughs> <laughs> but <there's>, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, yeah. Bodyography, so, so, um, we, when we talk about the translation just now, this is why I think Michiel had such a hard task and he did such excellent work, is that Zan, the language is a kind of a body and he had to weave this from the, the archive of Afrikaans to an English world, world and that is such a difficult task. Um, Maybe I've digressed too much for Let me just continue uh, on the topic of language. Um, there's something about the way you use language which makes the, the life of a translator either impossible or very interesting, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and uh, one of those things is, is the specificity of a certain, what you might call a certain sociolect, a certain kind of dialect that is only spoken in a certain area and is not transferable. But, but before we even think about that, I, I'm just in general, the way you use language is very far removed from simply moving a story on, although it does move a story on. It's very, it's very far removed from, from just relating or describing characteristics. It's a kind of, uh, an, almost like a character dysmorphia, uh, or a description dysmorphia. In fact, the, the Zan suffers from a kind of synesthesia. This, this is said in the book where she, where she smells color. Uh, yeah, that's, that's when you, you experience something which is meant for one sense via another sense. Right. A beautiful would say, yes, that's blue. Now, I think this is quite indicative of what you do with language because uh, there's a kind of poetic load in your language which, which makes the reading very dense and it is impossible to skim read Etienne's novels. It is simply not, not true. 
No, you must just go with the joy. You must just... <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a kind of, dare I say it, Joycean joyfulness in the deployment of energy in the language. It's a poetic energy, but it, it, and it draws very deeply on the natural idiomatic resources of the language. Now, can I move on to the translation? Um, as, a, as a result, the translation becomes very interesting. And I just want to say that I am absolutely in awe of Michiel Hanks' translation. Michiel, um, I had talked to you. I can, I, as I said to Michelle, uh, uh, Michiel recently, I can smell the steam of the labor. If I say, Vorstelen mit ein Sinner, then I ate the van der Sinner, coming off the page. And there's a classic problem for a translator in that if you're faced with, with a poetic language written in a sociolect that is untransferable, you have to accept a loss and seek again. There is an absolutely unavoidable margin of loss. You simply cannot write the word more symbolic is in any, any English word whatsoever. It will not do, it will not happen. You have to either use more symbolic is, which you can only do occasionally. You can't write the whole translation while leaving all the Afrikaans words in, obviously. Uh, but there's a kind of a gain that, that also happens. And I feel in this translation, this gain is quite extraordinary. And I, I, I actually went to a text of Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses today, just to confirm the sense I had that I, Michiel's translation has a kind of a Joycean feel to it, because it is a similar kind of racing text, uh, prose that, that sometimes disregards punctuation and, and easy stops and, and easy categorical sort of uh, markers and flows across and then also uses deeply evocative language. Yeah, I, I think part of the, the bodily protest of Zan is that she is language. I mean, she, she, the body speaks in her face. And, and it's this the syntax which is Wrought. Is that the right English yes. word? For uh, wrung. Highly wrought. Highly wrought. But, uh, not in the normal natural order. And, and you, would, you would have different words sitting together you, that you wouldn't expect. Now, the problem with that is, um, you know, I always say to my students, the secret of art is making strange. You know, the Russians have this wonderful concept of astronomy, saying, Okay, you can sit in a dentist's room and you see the little painting of Pater Noster boats. And you go to the next dentist's room with the same little paintings. But if you get a good artist, that artist will make strange, will make those little boats so strange that you look and you look again and you think. And I was once at an exhibition in the Kalkhoff Museum in Amsterdam. And they had sunflowers painted by a very popular approachable painter. Then they had for horse, you know, the well-known, it's become a cliche, it's so commercialized now, it's on t-shirts and so on. But then they had the, uh, a lot of German artists, and they all painted sunflowers. And it was fantastic, how strange, how they made strange. Now, with Zan, she came as the strange, raw turbo language. And the the the, the, the challenge was to make it natural. So how to make strangeness natural so that it flows. That's why I think if you get into the joy of the language, it should just take you. But that Michiel also had to translate to 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 carry over the, the main into English, but in such a way that it works, that it seems natural. And that's, I think, was, was difficult and very well done. Can we go on for a while before any other questions? One or two more topics. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, just for those, a uh, uh, 10 second synopsis of this novel, for those who really haven't read it and might feel a bit confused, there, there are two siblings. Uh, there's Hank, who is a museum curator in Somerset East, near, um, in, in, in Old Karoo, and his sister, Zan, who is a political exile uh, living in Amsterdam. So, and she, she is uh, flighty and orgasmic and ecstatic, and he's controlled and conservative, and he writes historical monographs on very slim historical monographs on, on historical figures, small lives, which he tells in a minimalistic manner. So there's this, there's this kind of uh, polarity between these two characters. And uh, so I'm wondering how, how you, and, and what, I, what I get the feeling about in, in the polarity between these characters, they represent a bigger polarity, which is between Africa and Europe. Uh, between a past and a present, and a new, a new re-entry in, into the bigger so-called transnational world, which which is now open and available, uh, it also poses some crucial problems of choice uh, in the novel. And I wonder if you'd, you'd like to talk about those, uh, including the choice between how to represent history. Um, you know, it's a novel about displacement, um, and this whole feeling of Hink going to Amsterdam, and he meets the pickpockets. I did a lot of research on pickpockets. I actually <laughs> talked to pickpockets in in, uh, in Amsterdam, which was fascinating, and also in Avignon and so on. So it was quite interesting research. Um, they, he meets up with the alternative people, the, the drifters in Europe, and, and the singer on the busker. Was, from North Africa and so on. And he comes there, he's from South Africa. Perhaps we should just say that he's there because his his Aunt Zan left the world, she's apparently dead, and she said he can he can only come fetch his request uh, in Amsterdam. Yes. And he must stay there. Yes. So it's come it's and check the house out and accept your inheritance. So he goes and he's got to decide, do I want to live in Amsterdam, do I want to stick it out in South Africa and so on. So it's, it's a novel about displacement. At the end, one has to give the story away now, maybe. But at the end, they both come back to South Africa. And they go to the as Ash Patch. The Ash Patch is where her former lover was executed. And it's close to Hochenbosch. If you know um, the plains of the Kandebu, uh, in, in Palma, she writes about uh, Hochenbosch, which is an old tree between Grafenet and Aberdeen, and it served as a gallows for many years, a spooky place. And this is actually where Wiermeyer, um, almost like a Bayes Ludia character, was executed. And they actually go back at the end to look for, for a relic, which is part of his backbone, which didn't burn out in the, uh, in the, the scene where they, they actually set him the fire and pour petrol over him. And, um, she goes back with Hink, and Hink is this controlled guy who writes, he writes these slim monographs, and they start dancing. That's the end of the book, and they dance this... Shouldn't I give the ending of it? Anyway, what happens at the end, I don't really understand. <laughs> but um, the very clever researcher, Sonia Lewitz, I spoke about, she's standing, she's doing a PhD on, on this, idea of the archive in Afrikaans novels, she will probably tell me that in a six months time or so what happens at the end of, of, of the novel. But it's interesting the choices made there. And let's not maybe say too much other than that it's a problematization of belonging and choices and displacement and home and so on. No, is, is that good? That's good. It's in, uh, before I, I asked Michiel to defend his translation or defend the pray against the praise of the translation, perhaps, uh, would you like to say something about Afrikaans writing and Afrikaans writers vis-a-vis uh, -vis South Africa, the world, uh, or the, the role or the changed role or your sense of what it means? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I um, often think um, of Pabuk, um, the Nobel Prize winner from Turkey. And he always moans. He's written wonderful books. And he's also interested in the archive. Okay, writers from the margins are always interested in this preservation and the 
difficulties of memory, detecting and so on. 